time, bro. Excellent, excellent. We've got an hour, please. Got an hour. Okay, cool. If you have any questions, you can enter them if you need to. Questions are awesome. All right, so um, my name is Gabriel Ryan. I'm a principal security consultant and co founder at a company called Digital Silence. Uh, we're basically a boutique security consulting firm, do pen testing, red teaming, code review. Well, I hate it. Um, but, <laughs> anyways. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. I'm going to skip that far. Okay, so um, this is a talk primarily about wireless pen testing. Actually, it's a, it's a talk about problems that people face when they're approaching like wireless pen testing against networks uh, using technology that's been created within the past like five, ten years or so. Um, but in order to really talk about wireless pen testing, we kind of have to talk about you know what a typical enterprise Wi-Fi configuration is going to look like. Anybody here actually like professionally manage a uh, an enterprise Wi-Fi network? Or yeah, okay, cool, excellent. So these guys will know what I'm talking about. Okay, so so most like enterprise Wi-Fi networks, they're going to have like you know dedicated components for for different functions that people are going to use on the network. Uh, you're going to have a guest internet. Uh, this is going to be straight plug out of the internet. And this guest Wi-Fi, um, it, it's going to be pretty much just you know what it says. It's, it's there to provide you know internet connectivity to guests. Um, you know, you're also going to have your corporate network access that's going to be much more secure, much more locked down. Welcome, welcome. Have a seat. <laughs> um, you're you're going to have um, your corporate Wi-Fi network, and that's usually uh, you know for uh, access to internal resources, uh, and, and it's a lot more locked down because that's what some employees are using to uh, do all their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, it, you know, if, if it's a really well set up network, there'll probably be like a UIFD network as well, so you can get those devices on, on not you know an isolated network and they're not kind of cross contaminating between everything else. Um, but the key thing is they're they're going to be varying levels of security for all of these. Um, but the one that really, really care about is the corporate Wi-Fi because that's the one that's actually, if you get into it, uh, you have the potential to actually start, um, you know, moving further into the network and, you know, getting access to, you know, internal resources and, uh, you know, people's laptops, stuff like that. So, um, if you know about about these, uh, you know, about the corporate Wi-Fi, the corporate Wi-Fi is usually locked down using WPA EAP. And the reason why they use WPA EAP is that unlike uh, the pre-shared key uh, style of WPA, where you just enter in a password, uh, the kind where you enter a username and password, uh, which is EAP, that actually provides encryption on a user-by-user -user basis. Uh, so you know, once you start to get uh, above like you know like 15, 20 users or so, uh, now everyone has their, you need a situation where everyone has their own encryption key, which is why they use EAP uh, for for corporate Wi-Fi. Um, Unless you're talking about ICS SCADA environment, so it's probably actually protected by work, but it's so an edge case there. Um, right, so how do you attack WPAP if you're actually for everyone pretty much, or most people, you know, if, if you work in pen testing for a while, you pretty quickly, you know, become accustomed to, you know, breaking into PSK numbers, you know, you just capture the WPA handshake and you get on the crack the, the what you capture and get on the network. Uh, WPA AP, you, you can't really do that. Uh, so you have to use something called a rogue AP attack in order to reach these kinds of networks. And you know, rogue AP attacks are pretty cool. They're, they're kind of like the bread and butter of wireless pen testing. And you know, fundamentally, um, there's, a, there's a couple different variations of it. The most fundamental one is, is called a uh, evil twin attack. Basically, what a rogue AP attack does is you force a bunch of devices to connect. So if, let's say we have this uh, uh, this wireless network here, and you see these these four laptops are connected to this access point, uh, and we have this one ESSID. And you know, if we were to create a um, our own access point with the same ESSID and, and uh, preferably channel of this access point that these devices are connected to, if you actually can provide a better signal to these devices than the target network's um, access point, these devices will actually drop their connection from the target, connect to you, and now you have a man in the middle. And when you think about you know, how uh, EAP works, which is what we were just uh, talking about, um, when you type in the username and password to get onto the corp Wi-Fi, um, there's like an authentication server running there in the background. Until you actually complete that authentication process, um, it's still basically an open access point. So this is the attack that you use to get access to those kinds of networks. You force the device to connect to you, and then they authenticate with your authentication server. You capture a challenge response, um, you crack it, and then you use the, the, those crack credentials to get on the, the network. And this is kind of like a very quick demo of, of what that looks like from the attacker's perspective. So you're just specifying the um, ESID of the, the target network, and you know we're just going to start this this rogue AP here, I'm going to skip this, it's taking a little while, this actually should be over here. Yeah, okay. So you should see a, a thing that says AP enabled very shortly. There we go. And we're attacking the SSID evil core. 
and which is too shortly as a, shortly as a client device watch that connects, and there we go, we have a ton of hashes. And then, essentially, you take these hashes, you crack them, and then you get on the Wi-Fi. So it's pretty cool. Um, the problem is that, you know, I mean, when, when, when we're looking at modern wireless networks, um, well, actually, in order to understand, well, before, actually, before we go into that, um, there are two ways to perform this attack. There's the variation I just showed you, which is that you provide a better signal stream. Right, and that's you know, the idea. There is you're going to entice a client device to um, to roam to your OAP uh, by providing a better connection. Um, the more commonly you're going to be using a, a technique called coercion, which is what essentially you're doing is you deny access to the AP that the client is connected to, and then you provide a different, you know, same network name, different uh, uh, BSS ID, and and that will cause them to roam from the really. Call from Kansas, I wonder who that would be. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, so, um, right. So, as I was saying, coercion, right? They're connected to an access point. You start spamming DOP packets to, uh, uh, to the access point. Uh, the clients can no longer connect to this. They start looking for a different access point on the same network to connect to. They connect to yours because you just happen to be there waiting with open arms. Um, you know, and you end up with a man in the middle situation like before. Um, most, you know, the, the problem is that like most modern hardware that you'll, you'll run into when, when trying to attack an enterprise Wi-Fi network uses uh, the, the newest variations of the 802.11 protocol. Everyone know what 802.11 is? Everyone not know what 802.11 is? I'll, I'll, I'll just, so 802.11 is basically just the fancy way of saying Wi-Fi. It's the standard that implements Wi-Fi. But the two latest versions of that are 802.11 AC and 802.11 N. Um, the problem is that existing tools for performing these rogue AP attacks uh, they either don't support 802.11n or 811ac at all, or they do it, but you have to like spend a lot of time, you know, editing config files and just generally hating your life when you try to get this attack work. And if you've been on a time box pen test, actually all pen tests are technically time box because you want to use your time as efficiently as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the problem is like you really don't have time for that. So um, on a typical engagement, so you, you're you're kind of screwed there. Um, so why is this relevant? Well, 802.11n and 802.11ac provide notably better throughput than 802.11a and 802.11g. 802.11a and g are the two older versions of the protocol that were used, you know, essentially n and ac were built off of the, um, you know, a and g, um, and you know, kind of expanded to provide these enhanced capabilities. Um, to kind of understand why why this this is a problem for for attackers, 802.11n and 802.11ac they they provide much better throughput and a much better signal than these older versions of the protocol. If you consider that 8 to 11G, uh, you're looking at like a maximum of like 54 megabits per second, which is actually the maximum allowed by the protocol itself. 8 to 11N, which is the next step up, and it's below 8 to 11AC, so 8 to 11AC actually goes, you know, even faster than this. Uh, but N actually, theoretically, you can reach speeds of 600 and 900 megabits per second. Um, that's, realistically, you're probably gonna cap out around 300, uh, but the theoretical limit's like 600 to 900. So what does this mean? Well, okay. If you look at these these uh, these frequency graphs, here we have an 802.11b access point. Here we have an 802.11g access point, and here is your massive 802.11n access point with all that bandwidth there. Um, and we talked about how an evil twin attacks. And essentially, the idea is that you're providing a better signal to this <coughs> device, and you're going to try to get it to come to you. Well, if you're working with 802.11g and you're capped at 54 megabits per second, and you know all the access points you're attacking are pumping out, you know, at least 300 megabits per second. Uh, you're, you're not going to be able to get that to work, uh, not easily, unless you're like right up next to the MSG. Um, yeah. Uh, so basically, what that means is that coercion is, is you know where you actually deauthenticate an access point and get it to roam to you. It's pretty much your only viable option in most cases these days. Um, so you know, I guess the question is, can't you just attack 8 to 11 in access points using 8 to 11 G access point? Well. Yeah, you can do that, and that's where coercion comes in. You create an 8 to 11 G access point, which is what most of the tools out there do, um, and then to get these devices to actually connect to you, uh, you just start spamming DOF packets. Um, the reason why this doesn't always work, uh, I want you to use this, you know, to kind of take a look at this example here. You have these two target access points in the top left and right. You have the, uh, the rogue access point in the bottom here. So this is you in the, in the very bottom center. And these two devices are the ones that you want to, you know, basically get to connect to you so you can steal creds for them essentially. Well, you know, they're connected to this guy here, and this guy is using 811N. One of the rights using 811N. So you spam DOP packets 
at this access point in the top left and hoping that it connects to you, but instead of oh, they just roam to the other one. All right, no big deal. Span this guy with the alpha packets too. Yeah, but then they just roam back to the first one. And you could literally sit here for hours until eventually you get lucky and it connects to you. But you, you will eventually get lucky. I mean, that's, but that's a horrible way to spend your client's money, right? It's just four hours trying to, yeah. So um, I guess, you know, the, 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 the obvious question here is, can't you solve this problem just by deauthenticating both, de both of these access points? Well, sure, but now you need three Wi-Fi interfaces. You need the first Wi-Fi interface to do the, uh, um, the rogue AP, you need the, uh, one to do the first deauthentication, and you need the other one to, de to simultaneously, concurrently, should I say, deauthenticate the second access point. All right, that's not a big deal. You just plug three Wi-Fi adapters in your computer. Oh, but what if they have three access points? Well, now you need four interfaces. All right, what if they have four? And this, this can keep going on and on. Then you think about your typical, you think about a place like this, how many APs there are in the room. You're gonna, I mean, unless you're like that, 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 that goofy Wi-Fi wi -Fi cactus guy. Um, actually, that's pretty awesome. But like, unless you're that guy, you're not going to be able, and even him, like, you know, he might run into a situation where he just does not have enough dongles on his back to, to get this to work. So, I mean, this can quickly get out of hand. Um, this is another solution I've seen. I do not endorse this or recommend it, uh, but I, I have heard of people doing this, and it, it's horrible. Um, a lot of 802.11n and AC access points pretty much stick exclusively to the 5 gigahertz spectrum. So you put up your own access point on 2.4 gigahertz spectrum and just jam the entire um, 5 gigahertz spectrum using SDR and just pipe you random into the 5 gigahertz spectrum essentially. Um, this is a wonderfully horrible idea, uh, but I mean, it's essentially how it would work. Jam it and then this forces them to kind of come back down to earth to your little puny 2.4 gigahertz access point and connect to you. Um, and it works, yeah. I mean, the problem is that, you know, you know what else uses the 5 gigahertz spectrum? Airplane radar, yeah, so like, yeah, so obvious repercussions, potential repercussions there. And because of that, it's very illegal to, well, jam just about anything, let alone the 5 gigahertz spectrum. And it's unsafe as well. Um, so I mean, basically, like, yeah, you have all these other options, but really this is just kind of, you know, honestly, it's been, you know, many, many years since these protocols have come out. Realistically, from the offensive side of things, we need a tool that can create APs using 811 and 811AC on both the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz spectrums. Uh, this talk, you know, it's a 45 minute talk, so I'm primarily gonna focus on N, uh, probably get to part two at some point about AC, uh, but can't really treat either one in enough detail in order to do both. Um, well, let's talk about why 811 n is so hard. Well, I mean, for one thing, access point configuration is highly complicated. If you're trying to configure a rogue AP that's just using G, you just you know, give it a, a, a channel, a basis ID, um, you know, network name, a few parameters, then you stand it up and it works. Um, it's a little more complicated with these, with these uh, high throughput and very high throughput protocols, though. Um, additionally, you, your access points have to be 802.11H compliant uh, in order to work on DFS channels. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but essentially it has to do with the airplane radar thing we just talked about. Um, and also there's this thing called basis overlap prevention, uh, prevention uh, which we'll talk about, and that has to be circumvented. Um, before we continue though, I think we should talk a little bit more about 8211 and itself, uh, just to kind of understand what we're dealing with. Um, there are five main technical improvements offered by 8211 and um, and the first one's uh, something called multiple input, multiple output, or MIMO. Uh, you also have spatial multiplexing. There's also channel bonding, that's pretty important. Um, also, they offer a really short guard interval, which is, which is great, and there's some map layer improvements as well. We're primarily going to stick to the first three because of, of time and relevance. Um, but yeah, so multiple input, multiple output, essentially what that is is that, you know, you know if you're not using multiple input, multiple output, uh, you essentially can only send uh, data uh, on, if you have, let's say you have two antennas, you can only send streams like one at a time. Multiple input, multiple output, you can actually break up a single data stream into multiple spatial streams, each of which is transmitted by an antenna. So the number of spatial streams you have is limited, is pretty much limited by the number of antennas you have. So if you have six antennas, you can actually break your your, um, uh, your signal up into like six pieces if you have six antennas and just transmit more of it at once. So, you know, basically you can transmit stuff faster, which is which is why it's great. Um, there's also this really cool feature, feature called spatial multiplexing. And, you know, so to kind of understand what spatial multiplexing is, it's almost easier to just talk about what a network does when it doesn't have, when it doesn't use spatial multiplexing. So here in this diagram, you have a transmitter on the left and a receiver on the right. And this big arrow thing is the operating channel um, that this uh, 
this access point is using. And these little red dots are, that's your data stream. And you can see we only have one data stream at once per channel. And that's the limitation imposed by, um, imposed if you're not using spatial multiplexing, one data stream per channel. Um, obviously that's very inefficient. So the cool thing about spatial multiplexing is it lets you send multiple data streams per channel. So you can see now we have these two data streams and they're all going you know, through the same channel. That greatly improves the efficiency of the access point. Um, so how does it do this? Well, actually you go back to that MIMO thing you're talking about where you break up the different data streams you know, into different spatial streams, each of which is handled by a different antenna. And that's kind of how you do that. So I think I just talked about that. Um, the third really important feature is channel bonding. Uh, so your traditional ADS will let in channel. Um, this is assuming something called OFDM, which is the kind of system we're going to be using. There's another way of doing this uh, that uses 22 gigahertz channels called DSSS, and it's not terribly widely used, so I'm not going to really talk about it, um, but just making you aware that it's there. But for the most part, you're going to be dealing with something called an OFDM um, access point. And you know, so ADS will let in channels, they're 20 megahertz wide. So basically, if you look at this, the frequency spectrum here, each of these is going to be like a 20 megahertz spectrum. Oops, I got lost there. Um, and, and so this big green thing on the left is a, uh, it, it's essentially a, that that's represents a single 20 megahertz access point. Um, so I mentioned the traditional 802.11 channels are 20 megahertz wide. Channel bonding actually lets you combine two or more adjacent channels, adjacent channels. With, with 802.11, it's two channels. You combine two adjacent channels to create a single larger 40 megahertz channel. It essentially doubles your bandwidth which makes it, you know, very powerful. So, you know, compare this here to this, and you can see you can transmit a lot more stuff because now you have two channels working uh, right next to each other as one giant channel that you're just pumping all this data through. Um, there's some other improvements uh, introduced by ADS11. As I mentioned, there's a short guard interval, and there's also some improvements to Mac, um, but this is a 45 minute presentation, so uh, not really gonna go over them here. This doesn't matter as much. Uh, but what does, all this, what does all this mean for pen testers? Well, okay, let's think about all this complexity we just added to, um, to Wi-Fi. And if you're you know, doing a real APA attack, you're essentially creating an access point from scratch using software. Um, and you know, just to think about like, what you have to do in order to do this using 811 n you first have to select a channel with, okay, 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz, not a big deal, right? You don't have to select an operating channel. Okay, starting, you know, that's not a big deal either. Now I have to select a hardware mode that works with, with that operating channel. It's either going to be A or B, depending on whether it's 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Then I have to set your HP parameters uh, correctly. So at this point, the problem here is ballooning. Um, and then, uh, we're not done yet. Uh, you also have to decide whether to allow non-HC connections to your HD access point. And there's like three or four different ways that, in, that you can configure that. Um, and you also have to select an appropriate number of spatial streams for your hardware. Uh, and, you know, bonus, if you chose a 40 megahertz channel, which Hertz channel, which you probably are, you need to decide whether to, to place that secondary channel above or below your primary channel. Because if you go look at this uh, the spectrum graph here, and your primary channel is channel one, you try to put your, you know, uh, your secondary channel below it, you're going to go off the edge of the graph here. It's not going to work. And, you know, if you get any of this stuff wrong, post APD, which is the uh, Linux utility that you use to create access points, um, it's either going to refuse to start or just silently fail, and, and you're going to hate your life. Um, so. Hence the lack of like out of the box support for this stuff. Uh, there is a method to this madness. Uh, you just need to know what the configurations options are for any given situation. The, yeah, or, or you can just automate it and use a tool that will handle the configuration for you, which is kind of what we're doing here. Um, so to kind of show you how we, we've done that, uh, right here we're, we're making an 802.11 and access point. And you see here that we've just we haven't specified the, the hardware mode A or B. We just selected. Uh, hardware mode N and, and, and the channel. And it's automatically going to figure out you know, whether we need to specify hardware mode A or hardware mo mode B based on the context. And you see here it's automatically selected hardware mode G based on the channel selection. And we can successfully uh, skip this forward a bit. Excellent. And it's gonna, we're going to successfully launch the attack there. So there's uh, your hardware mode selection. Uh, additionally, um, is this the same thing? Yeah, it is. I don't get PowerPoint, guys. I'm sorry. Um, okay, yeah. So that's cool. That will that will give you a single 20 megahertz 802.11 access point. You probably want to do 40 megahertz uh, channel width though if, you, if you're dealing with 802.11 n. 
So that, that's why we, we have a way of actually, if you want to do a 40 megahertz wide channel, you just use this, this, uh, this nifty little channel width uh, flag that you see up here. It's kind of rolling off the side of the screen there and going to the, in this side. We just set channel width to 40, and it will figure out, when you do this, it will automatically figure out where to put the secondary channel, uh, given on the, on, on the current environment also, like, um, you know, what it can and can't do based on, on your primary channel. So you, you see it's, it's doing that here. And see it forward. Yeah, and, and it just kind of works out the box. Um, you know, the, there are several situations you can find yourself in where you, uh, they're, you know, both putting the secondary channel above or below the primary channel, I mean, both of those are valid, and you might want to manually specify uh, which one you want to use. Uh, so if that's the case, uh, you can just manually specify it using the HT40 flag, and HT40 actually corresponds to, to a value in the CoSAP config file, that's why it's called HT40, uh, if you're wondering. Uh, but if you just put plus if you want the secondary channel to go above. I can rewind it so you see that. You just do plus if you want it to go above, and you do minus if you want it to go below. And then if you want to just pick for you, just type auto. But that's default. So if you're doing that, you might as well just kind of not use the flag at all. So uh, the, the second challenge here is that you know if we're going to do uh, rogue AP attacks on uh, using 8211n. Uh, in order to unlock you know, the full potential of the, the, the 5 gigahertz spectrum, we need to achieve something called 8211H compliance. Uh, what does that mean? Well, so we mentioned that certain parts of the 5 gigahertz spectrum are used by radar, uh, specifically airplane radar and weather, weather radar and all this other stuff that we don't want to mess with. Uh, so because of this, there are actually regulations uh, enforced by the FCC, EU, and all these other or, um, you know, the e relevant EU organizations. And you know, basically what these regulations dictate is, is uh, well, they pretty much state that if you're running an access point um, on any of these channels that are that overlap with airplane radar, you have to be your access point has to be capable of detecting and avoiding radar. So this is probably a cool. I mean, this is actually a uh, feature that you probably didn't know your home router has. Uh, but your 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 home router is actually if if it uses these channels, which it probably does, it's it's also a radar detector um, because it, you know periodically it's going to be checking to see it, uh, it's going to be listening for the presence of airplane radar. If it, detects, um, if it detects the presence of airplane, ra airplane radar, it actually has to shut, by law, it has to shut down the access point, um, wait 30 seconds, then start looking for a new channel that does not have airplane radar. So it just randomly picks another channel to operate on, and if it, you know, if, you, if it detects your airplane radar on that channel, it has to do it again. And actually, it's a pretty interesting denial of service attack where you just simulate airplane radar near one of these access points and on all channels, and it's just unable to run at that point. Um, although when you think about it, it's kind of it's a lot of work considering you could just use the authentication packs and achieve exactly the same thing. But it's a cool proof of concept. But yeah, I mean, if you want to legally operate on DFS channels, you're going to have to be compliant. So if you have, if you have a client that's running on DFS channels, you're going to have to operate on DFS channels as well if you want to do this uh, in the best way possible. So you're going to need to operate a DFS compliant access point. Uh, it's also a safety issue, as we mentioned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you know how we've addressed this. Well, we've added some flags to EVHammer, uh, which is this tool uh, that enable 8211H. And what this does is it grants access to DFS channels. Uh, you still have to, you know, if you're using just a, like a run the mill like version of, of Linux, you're, you're going to have to patch your kernel to enable DFS. That's on you because we're not really in the business of like writing kernel patches. Like that's your operating system. So that's kind of where the, the line draws between you know the software and what the user is responsible for. But you know, yeah, if you've got a, if you've got a um, if you have a, an operating system that's patched to enable DFS and through all the kernel modules and stuff like that, you can use EPAMR to control them and to enable access to the DFS channels. Uh, there's also a flag in there, uh, and this is really for resource purposes only. Um, this is not for use outside of a lab environment that's very legal. Don't do this. And there's actually two flags you have to combine in order to kind of affirm that this is what really what you want to do. Um, but you can you can force EPAMR to use the DFS channels without DFS enabled. Um, don't do that outside of a Faraday cage, please. Uh, but it's, it's there in case you need it. Um, so yeah, that's DFS. That's the third thing, or the second thing we have to add to, to get um, these rogue API attacks working on, on uh, it's 11 n uh, The third and final, and this, this, this part's actually kind of funny, uh, we have to circumvent something called ESS overlap protection. So if you look at this, this is actually uh, just a prototype that um, it's kind of putting together. Uh, basically what's happening here is that uh, we're trying to create an access point on channel 157. Uh, and you, if you kind of, I don't know if you can see the error output, but there's a, 
this thing fails actually. Uh, well, sort of, it still creates an access point, it's not where you want to put the access point. There's a message here that's displayed that says, um, switching own and own primary and secondary channel due to BSS overlap with, and it has a BSS ID of another access point. So what's going on here? Well, um, there's this part of the RFC in the 811 n that insists that you are not allowed to occupy the same primary channel as another access point. Um, and if you do detect that there's another access point running on that primary channel, you have to go pick another one because it's the RFCs, right? You have to follow the RFCs. It's, well, so here's the thing about this. This is actually not a legal requirement. It's an engineering requirement. It's something that IEEE came uh, up with. FCC doesn't care about this. So, you know, but we'll go over that in a second. But yeah, basically what, what, what happened here is that we created this access point, or attempted to, on the same, on the same uh, primary channel as another 40, 40 megahertz access point. And it just moved us automatically to a different channel, which is what we want to do. Uh, this is a problem, because if we think about how an evil twin attack works, it's beneficial to occupy the same ESSD and channel as another AP in order to force these client devices to connect to you. Uh, if you can't do that, well, things get harder. So essentially, this kind of breaks the whole thing that we're trying to do here. Um, fortunately, we can resolve this issue just by patching host APD. Uh, to ignore BSS conflicts. So HostDBD, once again, is the, the software that you use to create access points. Um, it turns out that it only really, you know, the, I, I kind of look into this, and uh, people who have just been designing their, people make their own routers, because people have very fast hobbies. Um, but some people like to make their own routers and use them, kind of like Raspberry Pis and stuff like that. And I guess there's a little community around doing this. And uh, credit to them, they figured out that, well, we don't necessarily want to follow this because none of the neighboring access points are following this and it, it sucks. So um, there are actually a lot of uh, a, a lot of patches out there for host APD, uh, really simple patches that, that disable this feature. And the reason why it's so easy to disable this feature is that host APD, it only checks for these neighbor, neighboring access points on start and then it just starts running. So it checks the launch and it says, okay, cool, um, and starts the access point. And there's like literally two functions. Uh, well, it's, it's one, basically the same function but two different files and you just have to basically perform a, a very similar modification. There's this, this really interesting function here called IEEE 8 to 11 check scan. Hmm, I wonder what that does. Um, well, there's this comment here that says check list of neighboring DSSs from scan to see whether 40 megahertz is allowed for IEEE standard blah, 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 blah. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit in that function, there's this neat little if statement here that, you know, depending on the, the result of this if statement, you may end up moving to a different channel due to the presence of a, uh, of a neighboring access point using the same channel that you're trying to create yours. Um, so the, the solution here, if you want to patch your, if you want to patch host activity to like not do this, not follow the RFC, is you just make sure that this statement always evaluates to false and patch your patch host APD. So we, we, we built that in and actually we see on this, um, this spectrum graph we're blatantly just running 40 gigahertz access point on the same primary channel as these, all, all these other guys here. Um, I was going to do a demo, but I don't mess with the center stuff uh, in terms of like running. I don't know, but so, but yeah, that's how that works. Um, so uh, yeah, so we've added that to eCamera um, as well. But I mean, this is pretty much everything that we've, we've added. Uh, so we, we've we've added out out of the box support for five gigahertz row VPs. Uh, we've added eight to eleven end compatibility. Um, you know, AC. Once again, that's part two. Uh, we've added support for WMM uh, for good measure. Uh, if you're interested in what that is, uh, talk to me later. Uh, and we've also made sure it's 802.11 compliant, so you can actually do this stuff without, you know, uh, <laughs> doing bad things. Uh, and, and, and the cool thing is also um, we, we've done all this by providing uh, as, as, as little manual configuration as possible. As, as we saw, you can just create the access point and it, it works, which is great for pen testers because we're really lazy. Um, check out the source code at github.com slash solstice slash ephammer. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? One question. So the con works a little bit of time ago is that if we're operating uh, an enterprise network and we're supplying that service and you come in to do a pen test on it, I mean some of the systems just automatically go ahead and be off the way and you can rotate the is do you work around that? Ah, so now you're talking, are you talking about like the, like the Cisco Meraki, Aruba style? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, a lot of the manufacturers are trying to do that by default, right? So where if there's Rogue AP, they'll just go ahead and do it One would think. Swap you off and... 
one would think. Um, so that's if you enable it, and a lot of people don't. Um, but every now and then you get you get that. But here, here's here's the caveat to that, right? All right. So when you think about how a rogue API attack works, you're not actually attacking the access point. You're attacking the clients that are connected to that access point. These these attacks still work. In fact, they actually work more effectively often if you attack these devices when they're not connected to the but they're not connected to the access point first. Um, so for example, if you think of a karma attack, it, you're just basically tricking stuff like these devices to connect to you. They don't necessarily have to be connected to um, uh, like an actual access point for that to happen. Um, you can do the same thing with an evil twin attack as well. Um, I guess what I'm saying here is that the access point does not actually have to be present in order to get this attack to work. So if you have any kind of situation where these devices leave your, your enterprise, but they're configured to connect to your network, using uh, weak versions of, of, of EAP, then all the attacker has to do is just follow your employees like out to lunch or something like that, and then own them there. And so I mean that's so it, yeah. So like I, I think you know I, I definitely always encourage the use of wireless IDS because it's just you know following the defense and death principle, you know it's it's the right thing to do, especially because it'll it'll weed it out like oh 90 95 percent of less motivated attackers. But you're always going to have that one pen testing company that just really douchey about it and just follows your employees to somewhere where that won't work. Um, so, um, as for whether you can bypass the, the IDS itself, well, that's an interesting question. It depends on the implementation. There are, and that's a whole other. It, it, now we're talking about like basically like the equivalent of like a WAF bypass, but then like, like wireless. There are ways to do it, but it's just a question of like, you know. How thoroughly implemented is, is the particular version you're doing? Some of them are really good, um, admittedly, and, and require a lot of work and are really well designed. Some of them aren't. Um, so, fair amount of in between. How you doing? So, um, Rogue uh, APs is existing by other methods, so we can say like a I'm sorry, how, how does one of these enterprise systems detect it? So there are a number of methods. Um, if we're talking about the evil twin attack um, that we talked about at the beginning, uh, well, the most obvious way is that you look for uh, an access point with a BFS ID or MAC address that does not correspond to one of yours. So you just use that's a one. That's easily changed. That's easily changed, exactly. Um, so that's where you get into. So there, there. Once again, this is kind of how the IDS is. There's this whole like rabbit hole of, of methods that they use. Um, you, there are a lot of things that you can look at. Uh, sequence numbers, uh, sig fluctuations in signal strength, that's one of them. Um, a lot of them actually, what they'll do is that they'll, they'll actually won't pay attention to the access points. Um, a lot of the commercial solutions, what they do is they actually pay attention to uh, the client devices that are connected to your access points. So they'll, they'll keep an inventory of, you know, you know, like all the different laptops that are connected to your network. And then when these devices suddenly, like, they'll notice, oh, well, suddenly this device says it's connected to this access point that's supposedly on my network, but I'm not receiving any traffic from this. Hmm. So they'll bring that access point down and then start attacking the attacker. And so, like the the better the, the better IDS systems work that way. And admittedly, it works reasonably well. Um, the problem is once again that you know I'm convinced that there's probably a way to get around that. Uh, just haven't looked at it long enough, but. Um, because I'm cynical, uh, but there's, yeah. Um, but I think the, the more fundamental problem there is, it, is it won't save you if you if you just wait till those devices are further away from the network where that IDS is not going to be relevant anymore. But that's just kind of an overview of how that works. Any more questions? So what's your capture? You get a high mm -hmm. You capture. How long does it take? Yes, EAP does. Um, uh, it, it, it does. However, okay, so I, I, I didn't go into that much depth into that. So essentially, what, what you're capturing there are it, it's, it's two components. Um, usually, if you're performing this kind of attack, it's going to be against a technology called EAPP uh, or TTLS, but its underlying principle is very similar. Um, you capture a challenge and you capture a response. Uh, you can then crack these to obtain essentially a plain text radius password. So you're not actually attacking the encryption itself. That's kind of like what the crack attack was doing, was attacking the encryption. Um, in this case, you're actually just recovering a plain text password. 
Uh, the interesting thing about um, just the turnaround time for doing this, uh, APP uses something called MS Shappy 2, and a number of years ago there was uh, some research done by uh, two researchers named uh, Moxie Marlin Spike and David Holden, if you've heard of them, um, they, where they wrote SSL strip. But um, yeah, so essentially, due to cryptographic weaknesses in MS Shappy 2, if you change your approach, instead of doing a straight uh, dictionary attack to recover these passwords, and instead you use a divide and conquer attack um, to recover uh, the, the NT hash of the password, which is not, it's, it's not plain text, but it's, 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 it's password equivalent. You can actually reduce your key space to, to I think it was like, I think it was like 70%. I, basically, like, are you guys familiar with like 3DS? Yeah, it, it basically MS Chappy 2 it boils down to 3DS. So you can reduce it to a very, very, you know, I think it's like 64 bits of encryption or something like that. And that's trivial to, to crack. So the actual turnaround for cracking this is, 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 is not as which is kind of what makes this attack so scary. Um, if you're using if you're using EPTLS, none of this is actually relevant. So if you have like a situation where all your wireless devices are connecting using certs. This whole thing falls apart. The problem is that you know, as a former as a recovering network admin, certs are hard, especially because you need to get the buy-in from the relevant people to deploy said certs and so the whole can of things. And that's why the adoption rate is very poor. Uh, anyone else? Wow. All right. You guys want to like play bingo or something? <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone.